descended the damn wall. I will try to get you another view. I'm Brent Pierre Smith. I have Jean de Herding on camera. Uh, we have James and Dangerous Dave out in the other vehicles and Geraldine and Kirsten in final control and Jamie out on tracking team. Hopefully, we're going to catch up with those lines we're tracking this morning. And let's see if we can show you <laughs> the second largest reptile we get at Juma. It hasn't disappeared completely. There he is, jean -Dre. So there he is. And he sat so nice out in the open for such a long time. A little bit of warmth after these cool days, causing him to come out and forage. So he's quite an effective little predator, as well as a very effective scavenger. Now, this is the Nile monitor, or water monitor. So we're in Jondre. And obviously a very happy monitor after the rain. They'll eat lots of different things, frogs, fish, birds if they can catch them, eggs of various different creatures, lots of different insects as well. Oh, looks like he might have sniffed something out there. Now, when he turns his head, you'll notice his tongue slipping in and out. There we go tasting the air almost. And incredible senses they have to be able to pick up any sort of dead or rotting flesh. Oh, he's having a little dig there. What you found, mister? So I'm sure he's been gorging himself on any termites he could have found earlier in the day. And he's using that tongue extensively. Oh, he thinks he's found something around there. No. You can see his ear hole as well when he turns his head to the side. Nice, relaxed. Quite a big one. Now, their cousin, the rock monitor, gets a little bit bigger than he does, and heavier. Very slow, deliberate movements as he hunts through the undergrowth there. So it seems like we're having a little bit of trouble with the Twitter sphere on this sunset safari, but emails seem to be working. So if you'd like to send us any questions, Please feel free to do that on questions at wildearth.tv. And soon as Twitter's back up and running, either James or myself will let you know. You can see those massive claws you can use for digging. And quite often when confronted with a potential predator, they use their tail as a defense mechanism, swinging it around like a whip. And I can tell you, after being whipped by a monitor lizard, it is a very painful ex experience. I was trying to remove my dogs from attacking one, and in aiding the monitor lizard, I got a severe beating. Well, we'll let him continue on. Now, we're going to do the same. I'm very slowly going to make my way back towards where we had those last lion tracks in Arethusa this morning. Now, Dave seems to think he saw a lion after drive today while he was at the car park. The rest of us are not quite convinced. I took a walk with Dave to where he said he saw the lion crossing underneath the power lines. I couldn't find any tracks, but he said it was chasing an impala. And we're going to go check now up the main access road. Maybe we'll find some tracks there. And hopefully, for Dave's sake, he'll be vindicated. Otherwise, there'll be much mocking and ribbing. So 
We're going to continue on, and while we do that, uh, let's go to Commander Bond so he can bid you a good evening. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, wherever you happen to find yourself on this, our fine and only planet here in the solar system, uh, commonly known as the solar system. I'm sure there are many others, but this is the only one that we are a part of. My name is James Hendry, and on camera today is David the Lion Spotter Eastor. Well, so he says. Anyway, uh, David, as Brent told you, saw a lion running past the gate today, chasing a hapless impala. Now, what we've done is come into around the area. We've got up there, you started off with some grey go-away birds, and they are, of course, shouting, which is an alarm call of sorts. And then, off to the left-hand side of your screen, we can hear some squirrels alarm calling. So what we're going to do is just take a gentle drive up this little ridge here and see if we can't spot anything. It's not entirely unusual for a lioness to move around on a cool day like it was this morning. Um, it's also, of course, as we discovered this morning, very difficult to track them on the hard, crusted ground that tends to um, occur. I suppose, form after rain comes. Now, you are on a live safari, as I'm sure Brent told you. You are in the northeastern corner of South Africa, which I'm also sure he told you. And our Twitter feed is not working at the moment. So please, if you want to send questions, and we encourage you to do so, anything you like, ask us about the country, ask us about the continent, ask us about the wildlife we're seeing, ask us about wildlife that we might see. Uh, questions at wildearth.tv if you're on the email otherwise the youtube chat function seems to work remarkably well that's how you can get hold of us you are most welcome it's good to have you with us let's just have a little poke our heads up this little road here and see if there's a lioness and if there isn't we'll see what other marvelous things in the wilderness there are to see today you may notice, of course, on my chest, I seem to have a honey badger attached to me. That is not, in fact, a honey badger. It is a um, makeshift wind filter uh, for my microphone. You may also send comments and compliments to my amazing haircut. You can see that I have chopped my hair slightly. I'm not going to show you the top of my head, of course, because there isn't any hair there to chop. Questions at Wild Earth TV, should you wish to comment on my hair. So the squirrel. And we're just going to look through the bushes there. It's very thick, so I don't think we're going to spend too much time here. We'll just have a quick look, see. And also, of course, when the ground is wet like this, we can only drive off-road on very kind of well drained soils. And those well drained soils are ridge crests, and we're not really in a on a ridge crest here, so we need to be very careful about leaving ruts and making a bit of a mess. We'll stop here and have another listen. And as it starts to get warmer, and it's quite nice, it's actually very pleasant temperatures, probably about 27 degrees, 28, 82 degrees Fahrenheit. As it starts to get warmer, so the insects are going to start popping out. So the, ins the birds will start calling a bit louder. And it's just a rather nice feeling of expectation that we get in there. A bit of heat after the rain that we've had, blessed rain that it was. The squirrel has seemingly gone to sleep. David, there's a rubber fly there. I don't, I don't suppose you can see it on the on the bonnet. Nowhere near where you're looking. There we go. Uh, you just <laughs> no, you can't see him. He's in the way. There's quite a magnificent fly there, but I'm not going to get him because he'll bite me, and then I'll probably cry, which will be very unbecoming, very unmanly. Okay, no lion here. Let's press on. See what else we can find.
Hello, Ashley. I love this question because it's always fascinated me. And what hasn't always, it's fascinated me until the day that I noticed precisely what you're asking about. And that then led me to look at other parts of the skeletal anatomy of various animals. And you say, isn't it true that an elephant only has one set of knees? That is absolutely true. And that the knees on the front legs are in fact elbows. No, the knees on the front legs are not elbows. If you, and uh, you can do this if you're feeling particularly athletic, if you go down into on all fours and then put your feet up, so basically like a downward dog position, if you like, uh, without your bottom in the air, because that's just uncomfortable. And that is basically how an elephant and every single four-footed animal is constructed. So that bend, that, that frontward-facing bend on an elephant's feet is the wrist. It's the wrist joint. It's the equivalent of the wrist joint. And from there, obviously, the carpal joints are a lot longer. The elbow is actually just under where you would think of the shoulder being. So what we describe as the shoulder, the front shoulder, is actually the elbow joint there. And then the shoulder, this part of the bone, the, the um, what do they call it, radius and ulna, uh, at least the humerus, is much shorter on something like an elephant, proportionately, and that goes up into the body. Um, I might actually try and draw it for you. I'm a, a terrible, terrible artist, but let me just have a go, because I'm not sure I'm being as clear as I might. Geraldine will not be able to speak to me. Right, I will talk loudly because I think I will can you just shout if you can't hear me, will you, David? Oh, yeah. Okay, so um, if we draw an elephant's foot, <laughs> I really am a terrible artiste. Can you see this? Yes. That's the foot. Right? We go up to what we call what we would call the knee joint, but that's actually the equivalent of the wrist joint. Then we go up to um, Let's draw the other bit here. The stomach here. And that would sort of go to the neck and head. And in here, this joint here that allows this articulation here where the leg moves frontwards and forwards, that is the elbow joint there, okay? And then the shoulder is up inside here. So that would go around to the elephant. His trunk would be over here. His head would be... <laughs> <laughs> something like that and his body would look like that that looks like a kiwi doesn't it david it looks like a kiwi bird okay so, so there's the wrist there is the elbow there the shoulder is up in here and it would actually extend pretty much to the withers over there so huge scapula huge big shoulder bone there and then the joint in there uh, will, will eventually be joined to the elbow by a radius elbow and uh, wrist and then the carpal joints will go the fingers will sort of go all the way down into the foot so i hope that kind of gives you an idea now if you look at any kind of animal a bat is a wonderful example we're all kind of built the same way and if you look at a, a bat and i've explained this once before but if go and find a picture of a bat on the internet if you can i don't have a good one here and you'll find that the membranes of the wings are spread amongst very long fingers and that's what holds them all in place. Five long fingers and very short kind of arms that hold them um, onto the body. Lovely question, Ashley. And of course, this leads on to hundreds and hundreds of di different kind of discussions on the uh, anatomy and skeletons of various animals, not only mammals. But it shows how closely related we are because the structure is very, very similar. We all have the same similarities, and if you look at the back leg, I'm not, I'm not going to attempt to <laughs> draw the back leg of the elephant uh, or the kiwi bird, depending on what you like. Um, Jerry says that looked like a platypus. Uh, <laughs> this is really astonishing how somebody can be so incompetent at drawing. Um, but if you look at at the back leg, it's the same thing. So that that sort of knee joint on a on a so we've checked very extensively the area of that mystery line and I'm just gonna let James know my update.
James, James. Hey. James, could you ask Dave if he's sure it wasn't a kudu chasing an impala that he saw? Negative. He said it was a lion and prefaced that it was an expletive. <laughs> okay, copy. Um, yeah, I've checked very carefully all along the edge of the tiller axis um, and I've only got hyena tracks there, so I'm going to leave the area. Okay, copy. So I couldn't find any sign there was a lion. Hopefully, for dangerous Dave or dazzling Dave's sake, it, it is found at some point. Otherwise, as I said earlier, I think there might be a little bit of teasing for the next few days. So we're going to slowly make our way back towards the western sections and see if we can pick up on those lions that we were tracking this morning and see what else might be out there as we meander to the west. Hi, Neville. How are you doing? Very good, thanks. How are you? Not too bad. You're on the right road. Yeah, you're on the right road. Cool. Just steps waiting for you. Okay. okay so we've got a, a new viewer, a very warm safari dive. Welcome to Anki Pank. And is a, who is a new viewer and would like to know where in Africa are you? Well, we will start on the major scale and work our way down to the minor scale. We are in the country of South Africa. Uh, more intently, we are on the eastern side or the northeastern section of the country in the province or state uh, of Mpumalanga, which basically means where the sun comes up. So a very good name for the eastern province as the sun rises in the east. And if we go even smaller, we're a part of what is called the Greater Transfrontier, or Greater Limpopo Transfrontier Park, which is 3.9 million hectares, or around just over 8 million acres of unfenced wilderness for animals. And if we go even smaller, we're within the Greater Kruger National Park, which is about 2.4 million hectares, uh, about 4.5 million acres of unfenced wilderness. And if we go even smaller, we are within the Sabi Sands Private Game Reserve, which is a privately owned piece of land that, that, where there are no fences between it, oh, elephants, and the Kruger National Park. And if we go even smaller within the Sabi Sands, we're right up in the north, uh, in, working in an area called Juma and Arethusa Private Game Reserves. And we have now just come across a nice breeding herd of elephants. And it looks like they're going to come straight towards us. Hello, oily finks. Nice little guy there. Looks like quite a big herd spread out through the bush here. Yeah. I'll be quite happy after this little bit of rain. I'm hoping these guys are going to head up towards a nice mud wallow that I know of uh, for a bit of splish splash. Yeah, nice adult female. See, she's seeping from her temporal gland slightly. And that can be sometimes a sign of stress. Oh, look at the little guys. We've got an inquisitive one. Hello, little boy. And that's definitely a little boy. You see his tushes or tusks just coming out. And probably just over a, oh, over a year now. Giving us a good once over. And here comes one of the great grand dams of this herd. You can see a big old adult female. Nice set of ivory on it. Oh, amazing how such big animals can move so quietly through the bush. Another big female coming through. Another oldish female. If we look on her head, you can see slight indentations above her eye. 
And as elephants get older, those seem to become more pronounced. I'm guessing she's probably around 40. And if we look down towards her teeth, elephant argument there. One of the babies got in the wrong way, a wrong, wrong place, and got a, a severe talking to by the adults. And it looks like we're in for a treat because they are heading straight towards that mud wallow. Shambhu and Love slowly mobile west on via tele access. Just to or just at the junction sandy patch with access. So a lot of you might be wondering what I was doing there. I was just letting all the other game drives around know what I'm what we found. And because finding animals is a team game, the more we communicate, the more areas we can cover and the best sightings we can find for you. A great big grey bottom. I can actually hear them even more off to the left in the bush as well. There could be quite a few around here. And see, stop for a quick snack on a bush willow. Let's get a little closer. So it's very important to stay very calm and relaxed around elephants. Uh, you can tell from their body language whether they want you around or not. And these guys are very relaxed, so I feel no, no not a worry about getting closer to them. See, tail wagging happily. They extend their tail straight uh, or upright. It's a sign of them being uncomfortable. And when you do see that with elephants, it's often a good time to give them some space. Massive animals, a big female like that's probably weighing around three, three and a half ton. A big male can be as much as six tons. Always try to keep your gear in low range. My day, little man. So that's very distinct little elephant bull behavior. They like to be very big and tough, and they quite often come running up to the vehicle. But as long as mom's close by. So you guys might just hear some beeping for a few seconds now. We're just turning on our virtual reality rig. There it is. is starting to spread out and feed when they get into an area, so we've got elephants on both sides of us. I am hoping some of them do make their way towards that mud wallow, which is just over the ridge here. There's nothing quite as cute as a baby elephant enjoying a mud bath. So on a lot of animals we see out here in the African bush, we see them quite often accompanied by a little bird called an oxpecker that feeds off ectoparasites such as ticks and lice. And you'll notice we never see them on elephant. And I wonder if anyone out there can tell me why we don't see them on elephant. And if you know the reason, you can send your answers through to questions at wildearth.tv. Uh, see how clever you all are. I'm just going to try and move a little bit forward so this female isn't behind the stick for you. 
Oh, she's gonna move on as well. They're slowly moving through the bush. Feeding as they go, which is a constant, a constant thing for elephants, being so big. They really do need to feed a lot. Here you go. Hello, mister. The ears out. So that behavior from young animals isn't so... Oh, there we go, middle of the road. There's going to be a bit of playfulness. Yes, little boys, a bit of rough and tumble. Boys will be boys. Sorry, guys, I'm just trying to see what's happening with my radio. So, while I try to fix that, why don't you guys enjoy these eddies for a second? So guys, I just need to try to fix my radio. Those elephants have gone to the bush. While we do that, let's go have a look what James is up to. We found nothing. We were just stopped here, uh, sort of having a look at quarantine clearings, uh, doing one or two administrative issues here on the car. Anyway, um, what I did want to say has now slipped my mind because we were going, we were talking uh, about the skeletal anatomy of various animals. Ooh, there's a bird up there. It's a grey headed sparrow, I think. Yes, it is. Now, if we take the little discussion that we were having, and Dave, there's also a, a black, southern black tit, just to the left-hand side, and another grey-headed sparrow, probably Mr. and Mrs. Sparrow and Mr. Black Tit. What I was saying about the skeletal anatomy of various animals was that they are so similar. And even birds, if you look at their skeletons, you cannot help but be struck by the similarity of structure to, first of all, reptiles, then to mammals, and of course, amphibians. All have got four limbs. Every single vertebrate, i.e. animal with an internal skeleton or backbone, has got a similar structure in terms of the limbs. Yes, there are modifications, as I explained with the bat, and as I showed you with the elephant, as, uh, as Ashley has looked, and I hope that those of you who have got cats and dogs at home um, are examining those, and those who are perhaps uh, looking at this at the office, or uh, maybe you hauled a colleague into your cubicle to uh, have a thorough examination of their skeletal anatomy, just to make sure that I'm talking the truth. But the interesting thing to me, of course, is the genetic closeness. Now, you will hear and you will read that we are, depending on which way you look at it, about 98.6% the same as a chimpanzee. That's what our d DNA is. Now, that's not particularly remarkable when you consider that we're about 50% the same as a banana, I'm reliably told by a professor of anthropology. 
anthropo anthropology. Uh, so um, not particularly amazing, but it is incredible to think that we're only 1.6% different DNA-wise from a chimpanzee. And if we are 50% the same as a banana DNA-wise, I know that sounds outlandish, but it is true. We are very closely related to that southern black tit, to the nyala, to the impala, to the elephant, to the animals that we have around here. And it's all just uh, the more different you can get, the more that is beautifully laid out in the fossil record. And it just shows a remarkable um, contiguous evolution and speciation of species and it is just a marvelous thing to watch as you go through nature and of course a wonderful saying that i really enjoy is that you can't really study nature but through the eyes of evolution now how how it all occurred we're not really sure but to see how animals have adapted to their environments and how closely related we all are i think is just a remarkable thing now, we're going to continue along the route that hopefully will bring us to David's lion. A couple of hyena tracks here. Um, but given the uncertainty and the lack of ability to drive off-road, we're going to probably not spend a huge amount of time looking. We'll go in search of other things. David saw his lion, Debbie, at uh, what time, Dave? Just after drive. Just after drive, yeah. About nine o'clock. About nine o'clock, David was uh, having a morning constitutional outside, considering life and philosophy and all things that are important. And a lion went running past. Now, Debbie, you say maybe it is having a drink. Uh, that's why we went to Gallagher Pan. We did have a look, but no, no tracks there. And that was from there that we heard the great go away birds going, but unfortunately, they didn't seem to be shouting at anything particularly significant. Now, everybody, Brian, of course, is now become completely obsessive about taking a time lapse once a day. And he, every time I drive around, I think I'm surely not going to find Brian's. Brian's tripod, and there it is. I found it again. It turns up in the most obscure places. Anyway, it's good to keep the creative juices flowing, these time lapses and personal little videos that we take. I took a remarkable little picture, which I will post at some stage, of a terrapin today in a pan. And of course, these fancy cameras these days, you can stick them in the water. And we've got some really nice results of a terrapin sticking his head out of the water. It's brilliant gold and ye uh, red colours, which you don't see when you look at terrapins from afar. There is an impala, or two, possibly related to the ones that, uh, that David's uh, lion was chasing. David, I'm sad that the lion wasn't a male, because then, of course, we could call it David, but as it is a female, we can't really call it David, can we? So young Impala and its mother and her mother. No, his mother. Look, he's got his little horns. You see his little horns have come up. I don't know where the rest of them would be. They must be off in the thicket there somewhere. It'd be very dangerous for them to be lurking about here on their own. The thing about it being a grazing animal, of course, is that you have got to, at some stage, put your head down. Now, no matter how well you're designed, when you put your head down, you are not going to see as well as you would otherwise. And I learned something the other day from an article that a, that a viewer sent through. And that is that you know how, uh, I'm just trying to think of the best example. If you look at a cow's eye or an horse's eye, they've got a kind of, it's not a slit pupil, but it's a kind of rectangular pupil. <clears throat> and what the eye is able to do is that when they put their heads down, unlike you, if you put your head down where you're sitting now, uh, your vision can blur slightly because your eyeball is unable to adjust within its socket. It's pretty much fixed to looking straight out in one direction. That's why if you lie on your side, it takes a little while to get used to watching the television if you're on the couch. And that's beside the point. But one of these animals can 
if they put their heads down, their eyes automatically swivel so that they're looking upwards, they're looking at an angle like that when they're grazing. So it does help them, but they're certainly not nearly as aware as when they're looking around like they are now. On we go. Flying termites. Jack, you're in Sweden and you want to know why it is that I say we can't drive off-road. We can in some areas, Jack, but in areas like... Here's a really good example. Jack, if we look off to the left-hand side here, you can see that this area is inundated with water. Now, if we drive off-road there in a great big heavy vehicle, we leave a rut. That rut turns into a site of erosion and creates damage. And that's why we don't drive off-road too much after a heavy rain like we had. Remember, we had almost 70 millimeters, almost four inches of rain. That's a huge amount of rain. So the next few days, we're going to be a little bit more cautious about driving off-road. Dave, there are a whole lot of actually flying ants, not termites. These are genuine flying ants. Look at them here. Can you see them? I'm not sure if the camera can see them. There we go. Look at that. Now. Many of you will have learned that, uh, or certainly referred to flying termites as flying ants, but they are not, of course. A termite is most closely related to a cockroach. Look at that. These are actually flying ants. They're royal ants that are going to start off their own colonies. So it's an example of what we call convergent evolution, where two completely distinct orders of insects have developed the same strategy for breeding. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> They're all around us, obviously very difficult to try and find them with a camera, but you can see them flying past there as that thunderous steel gray sky moves overhead. David, I think you'd probably get an award if you can track a flying ant with a camera. Look at millions of them in front of us. And they're hovering. They're much easier to film than the termites, which tend to move a lot faster. I've got no idea what species of ant they are. And like I've said before, the invertebrate diversity is quite intimidating. To say that they are flying ants is like basically saying uh, that's an antelope. Or, you know, if we were referring to animals, it would be to say that's a carnivore seeing a lion and saying, well, that's a carnival, don't know which one. That's how many hundreds and hundreds of different kinds of ants there are. How cool is that? Very cool. Now, an ant belongs to the order Hymenoptera, same as the bees and same as the, what's the other one? Bees and the wasps. And that means that the queen now, this is for those of you who are into your kind of slightly more deeper biology. The queen is what we call haploid. No, not haploid. The, the workers are haploid, which means they don't, like you, have two copies of DNA, like they would with a termite. They're basically clones of each other. Female clones of each other, they only have one set of DNA. The queen in a hymenopterid nest, or an ant or bee's nest, only breeds once with a drone or with a male. And for the rest of the time, she doesn't breed at all. And so the youngsters that she produces are sterile and they only have one set of DNA. That is so cool. Right, on we go, David. Enough of the answers. Find your line, please. Off to Arathusa to see if he can find.
So we've crossed into Arethusa and I'm slowly making my way back towards where we had those last tracks. And hopefully we'll have a little bit more luck. They sent us on a proper wild goose chase this morning in all sorts of directions. But hopefully we'll be able to find them. The Sunset Safari. So, for those of you who might have missed the Sunrise Safari, we're looking for the Inkahuma Pride. And the tracks went from Sibambini onto Arethusa overnight. And we had tracks of them chasing zebra, chasing giraffe, chasing pretty much everything. But such a mix, mash, and myriad of tracks. It was very difficult to get a genuine direction for them. But we all think they're somewhere in this area up ahead of us. Well done to Marilyn in Montana. Uh, we saw a lapid-faced vulture on the Sunrise Safari while we are searching for those lines. And that's 137 on Marilyn's bird list. So, well done, Marilyn. So we've had a couple of answers in for the ox, pecker, and elephant quiz. And someone said it was too, the skin was too thick, uh, which is not the case. They do get quite a lot of ticks. And Mary in Michigan said they don't like them, so they chase them away. That is a very correct, Mary. But they have an appendage that none of the other animals can, because the ox peckers can be quite irritating. We'll often see buffalo sort of blah, 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 to try to get rid of it. But they have their trunk, so they're actually able to reach around and chase ox peckers in a way that a lot of the other species would not be able to. Ooh, a bit muddy here. I was following up with Sean and De Beer this morning. I just want to try and get hold of Sean now. Sean, Sean. Sean or De Beer coming? Stations, I'd like to be the third following up on those in Gala, um, coming in from Sibambeli, Arethusa Cut Line. Sorry, Sean, I, I missed that there. Sorry, guys. Sometimes our radio comms can be a bit.
Well, we're in the right area. So, Sean, it was Sean we were following up with this morning and De Beer. And so what Sean's saying is his truck is on foot following those tracks in the direction that towards this road we're on. So fingers crossed. Wait. Come across that. Nope, false, a false alarm. This saw a slight different colour there next to the torchwood. But it was nothing, unfortunately. So while we continue to search for these lions, uh, let's go across to James, who's with the largest ruminant in the world. There is a giraffe, everybody, uh, very clearly seen by his, well, reticulated shape, I suppose, but I don't want to give you the impression that he's a reticulated giraffe. He is not. He's a southern giraffe, one of nine giraffe subspecies. Now, if you would like to, and Twitter is working again, hashtag Safari Live, please tell us what those other nine species are. You may not under any circumstances consult the oracle that is Google or Wikipedia. So let's try and get them just simply from your memory. If you can get all nine, uh, well, you don't have to send through nine, send through as many as you know, and we'll try and get all nine between us. I can never remember them all. You can start with the southern giraffe, and I've given you the reticulated. You need another seven. None of them occur here. And I love that one in the middle there. He's my favorite. He's got little paintbrushes on the top of his head. See? Totally useless to someone like me, of course, given my artistic talent, as you saw it earlier. But there you can see he's got these little tufts of hair on the top of his head. <laughs> I've never seen that before. I'm not sure why I find it so amusing. There he is. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, that chap was born just before October, so sort of in September, I guess it must have been. And so he is now October, November, 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 almost six months old. And he is a he, I think, isn't he? I'm pretty sure he's a he. He is a he. I'm sure that's the chap. And he was born around here. His mother is this uh, gorgeous redhead just in front there. That's her eating there. She's got a really nice kind of chestnut color to her patterning. And the giraffe, of course, do have different kinds of patterns, different colors. Very pleasant afternoon out with the giraffes. Panky Pank, in <laughs> you, you, you're a new viewer, and your your YouTube or Twitter handle or whatever kind of uh, handle it is, Anki Pank, is an interesting one. Where are you from in Europe, Anki Pank? You want to know why it is that giraffes do not live there, and it is a pity that they do not. You will find that they do actually. I've seen one in Ireland. It wasn't, of course, a wild giraffe. It was in this sort of Irish safari park. It was quite. A, disturbing sight to see. Anyway, they are around the place there. Um, Anki Pank, they don't occur there, like many of the animals of Africa, because of a, the small matter of the Sahara Desert. And you'll find that the Sahara Desert, the biology of or the biodiversity of the planet, north and south of the Sahara Desert, are profoundly different. It's not the same for some of the cats which have managed to get across. So lions, interestingly, used to be the most widespread animal, I think the widespread mammal in the world. They were found throughout Europe, and they were found all the way, obviously, through Africa. And I think, actually, they went into the New World as well. They were killed out there many, many years ago, uh, many thousands of years ago. But giraffe, buffalo, zebra, hippo, rhino, elephants, all of them would have been stopped in any kind of northern migration by the great big Sahara Desert. 
which runs in a band across the north of Africa. And that would have, that's why the biology and the biota and the animals and plants and fauna and flora of the northern side of the Sahara Desert is so profoundly different from that to the south. So that's why, Anki Pank, wherever you happen to be in Europe, you don't happen to hide them walking down the street outside your home. Let's go a little bit forward. Herbert. See, I told you she was a magnificent redhead. Look at her. Um, Herbert, you are what we describe here as taking the mickey. You say you get the great spotted giraffe, the long-necked giraffe, the toys are us giraffe, and one correct answer, the Rothschild giraffe. Your last answer is correct. Your others are utter nonsense, Herbert, but um, certainly good for a laugh. Thank you very much for that. We do enjoy a bit of humour now and then. Just move again. She's been tremendously confiding, this one. The mother of our little paintbrush friend. Hi. She's only now about 10 metres from us. Now that's about 33 feet, which is not very far at all. So thanks to Herbert, we have the southern giraffe, the reticulated, which I gave you. Herbert has given you the Rothschild giraffe. There she goes, wandering across the road. Now, I've been looking quite carefully at the animals, and obviously one of our major narratives at the moment is the drought and what's happening with the drought. And I've been watching quite a few of the animals, and. I think the impala is starting to show signs of drought. Quite interestingly, they're all starting to look a bit skinny. I think, mm, given the rain that we've just had, they'll probably start to put on a bit of condition now, which is good. The buffalo also starting to look a bit hippy, but the giraffes aren't. The giraffes are fine. And I think that's probably largely to do with the fact that they are browsing. They're not grazing. So there has, up till now, been enough for them to eat. Continue a little bit further forward. She's just being amazing. She's now about five meters from us, about 15 feet. This is incredible. So she stands, everyone, at about two and a half to three meters. That's about 10 or 12 feet. That's much higher than 10 feet. It's at least 12 feet, three and a half meters. So she's 12 to 14 feet tall at the head. And she's eating very selectively. So she had some combretum over here, then she found the tannin a bit much in that. Now she's gone off and she's eating some black monkey thorn with vicious, vicious thorns. And the two tree species she's eating, of course, defend themselves in totally different ways. The combretum makes chemical defense, makes tannin, and the acacias make thorn defense, or kind of mechanical defense. Now, the reason that young bull is running is because I watched him trip over a tree. So he wasn't panicked by anything. He just tripped over a tree, and that's why he looks embarrassed. It's a beautiful afternoon. You can hear maybe the doves calling. You can hear the woodland kingfisher there. A couple of long-tailed or magpie shrikes. And all this because it is rainy, or it has been raining. The heat has brought out a number of insects. We've seen termites and flying ants and dung beetles, wonderful dung beetles come out to see us. And 
the birds, of course, will now be feasting upon them and singing for joy as they do so. All right, let us move on to the raft, David. Here comes the Toys R Us giraffe now. Don't panic. Very nice. All righty, on we go. Jerry, I'm... Oh, there we go. I'm hearing Jerry again. Oh, hello, Christine on Twitter. You're um, obviously something of a giraffe fan. Let's see if I can get these all. Nubian, fawny crosses. Thornycrofts, Rothschilds, Maasai, Reticulated, African, uh, and South African, sorry, and what was the other one you said? West African, and Cordofan. There we go. That's eight. We're missing one. And I think it's, which one is it? Can't remember. Oh, Dave. Oh, it's the same. That's the fourth one I've seen today. It was a slender mongoose, but they don't ever sit still. Thank you, Christine, that was brilliant. Well done. I think we're missing one. Ah, I think I left one out when I read them out. Okay, so we got it. Don't forget, everyone, nine of them. Unfortunately, that slender mongoose has disappeared. All right, so it goes. Let's see what else we can find around the corner here. Always enjoy the sight of these dead trees against the gray sky. Very atmospheric. especially after the blinding heat of the summer. As I say sometimes, you know, I think it must be a bit incongruous for many of you who live in, under cloudy gray skies for a lot greater, for a far greater proportion of the time than we do. Those of you who live in Britain um, and in Northern Europe and perhaps even bits of Southern Europe, and parts of Canada, you live under much more cloudy sky than we do. And so when the cloud comes and we're all so happy about it, you must think, you're, are you mad? You're out of your mind. Because you obviously just wait for the sun most of the time. But after the summer we've had, it's such a relief to have this blanket of cooling cloud above us. It's so magnificent that it managed to deliver some rain at last. Right, we'll keep an eye out on the road for tracks here. But I'm a bit worried that Dave's giraffe has gone and done a runner on us. Dave's lion, sorry, not Dave's giraffe. Ah, now Naomi, you're in Pretoria, capital of our fine country, recently voted the most beautiful country in the world probably by South Africans, as I've said, but they are absolutely correct. Um, Naomi, you want to know about what the giraffe was eating, and because you've read that sometimes young trees or acacia trees will produce a substance that makes them distasteful and the giraffe will move on. Naomi, the story is actually even more clever than that. The story goes, and it's not just acacia trees, it's a number of different species of trees. They actually communicate with each other and they do it through means of pheromones. So, if you watch giraffe feeding in a grove of, say, acacia, berkeye trees or black monkey thorn trees, they'll go to one tree and then they will very seldom feed on the tree next to it. 
and they'll move sort of four or five trees along and feed on that tree and then do the same thing again. Now what happens when a tree is attacked by a predator, i.e. a herbivorous giraffe, it has, creates a response. So when you damage the tree, it creates a response. The tree increases the amount of tannin, which indeed does make it uh, distasteful, and the giraffe will then move on. But the other thing that it does is produce a pheromone, which travels in the wind to other trees close by. And that, before, that causes those other trees to raise their tannin levels before the giraffe can even get there. And it's an absolutely brilliant um, adaptation. And it's been counterbalanced or counter counteracted, if you like, by a giraffe that will normally feed into the wind. So they won't feed downwind into the grove, they'll feed upwind into the grove, because that means, of course, is that the pheromones can't travel to the trees that it wants to go and eat. Isn't that amazingly brilliant? So Naomi, that's the story behind the tannins and the giraffe causing the trees to talk to each other. I believe Mapani trees do the same thing. Um, I'm not sure if any of these Cabritums do that, but the, the acacias certainly do. All right, let's head across to Brent Leo Smith. He's got an update on his lion tracking expedition. We'll continue south. See you just now. There you got some wildebeest and zebra. Now, we found tracks of where the lions were chasing zebra. So I came to the furthest on. These are, might be the exact zebra the lions were chasing. So maybe the lions are still off to the south of us from where we are now. These, the, the zebra and wildebeest look quite relaxed. We bumped into some of the Arethusa trackers a few minutes ago. Um, down in the Marikini drainage, uh, checking to see if the lions crossed out this direction. But so far, no luck. So we're going to go on a bit of a wider circle, back away from this area. And you can see the zebra's starting to disappear off a bit into the thickets. Just the bottom showing. So, well, at least we've definitely concluded for sure that the lions aren't in this exact spot. They still could definitely be between us and the Marikene Creek system. So we're going to slowly loop back around to there, maybe check a little bit further east than we were. Gonna go really slowly to see tracks at the moment. There's another wildebeest. Hello, mister. Enjoying the nice flush on the grass. And he's Oh, he just spotted the warthog piglets off to the left. <laughs> he got a little bit of a fright, lifted his head quite quickly. Can you see them, Chandra? There we go. He's actually going to walk right and past them now. And piglet off to the right off his bottom there. Also very much happy with this nice new green flash. And there's mom off to the left just behind the bush. And I did see another baby. I think she's got two piglets left. Doing quite well so far. And Vildi going to follow the rest but with the zebra. So Tom is wondering whether James and I have ever seen the Elusive Seven. Now, by the Elusive Seven, I presume, Tom, you mean the Big Five plus Cheetah and Wild Dog, if that's the case. Uh, we have, most definitely, on quite a few occasions, I would think. So 
though, with this hard ground after the rain. It's checking very, very carefully. We don't want to be the guys who miss the tracks. I'm feeling less confident the further we head this way. I'm definitely thinking there must be. Closer towards the drainage. And there's Shawnee. Ah, some more zebra and impala off to the left. I think we're going to scoot past these ones and go in search of those lions. Oh, there's some elephant coming. As well. Just saw a big grey beast through the bushes. Quite far off the road. As you know, we won't be doing much off-roading after the rain. Did you see that earlier again, John, right? Where do you go? Glove. There's lots down. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. Saffron. I oh, know. I just bumped into them in the Marikeni. No. I was going to go back around Bumper House that way. Awesome. Hopefully, we, we managed to find these elusive lines at some point today. Yeah. Cool. And we shall. Well, good luck. <laughs> For once, you know. Yeah. Well, enjoy. Hi, everyone. Yes. Now, that little antenna up there is sending a thingamabob to somewhere else that eventually ends up everywhere. Computer. <laughs> yes, it's quite, quite <laughs> fancy. <laughs> At least my job is not to explain that, but to look for animals, it's much more fun. <laughs> Very cool. Enjoy. Good luck. We'll see you at them. Hopefully, yeah. yeah. Cheers. There we go. We're just bypassing Sean from Arathusa with his guests. Um, he's also in search of the elusive Inkahuma pride. So these tracks are seriously giving us the run around. I mean, literally going east, west, north, south, every which direction. Franklin alarm calling, always worth a double check. More than likely from a mongoose or such other thing, but you never know. Shouting in this little erosion system here. Oh, we're going to jump across to James very quickly, who's got a great grey behemoth. Right here, when the elephants came out of the bush, we were doing a little take on a, well, you don't need to know about that, but this elephant calf has taken slight exception to us. It's a massive herd. They're all over here. She's quite young, so I'm not worried about her there. But I'm interested in why she's taken up a sort of point guard on and sort of defending us from the rest of the herd. It's a massive herd. 
I'm just going to be quiet. Just watch this. Watch them all coming through here. We're just going to be very quiet. elephants here. <laughs> that was unbelievable. I don't know why they're running except to say that they might be going to water. No, they've just stopped to eat. Let's see if they stop there. They're more than that. There are whole masses more in front of us streaming across the road and they've headed into the bush. Gee whiz. Um, right, let me uh, just... Uh, why my heart rate goes down a little bit, Dave, you all right? Yep. Amazing, smiling? Yep. Yes. Incredible. We were just parked here and we were doing a recording and introduction for a sort of clip that we've been trying to make. And I heard, must have been the matriarch or one of them, just calling a deep rumbling in the middle of the bush there. And I said, oh, don't worry, Dave. It's a herd of elephants. Let's carry on. Let's do what we're doing. And then I sat down here and they just came out. And that youngish cow came walking towards us with that kind of angry lope. And then she stopped in front here. And it was almost like she was protecting the rest of the herd. She was saying to us, don't come any closer. Everybody, you go round me. I will protect you from these, this vehicle. And then the rest of them came and stopped and they assessed us. And then they walked off. And at no stage did I feel threatened. I did feel, though, that were we to go any further or go any, you know, kind of uh, make a noise or escalate the situation at all, then it could have got nasty. Wow. <laughs> and we were just doing... One of the interviews we just were doing while we were off air was the one on elephants and how Elephants have been around vehicles in the Sabi sands for the last 30 years or so. And how it's become possible now to drive into the middle of a herd and it leads to what we call Sabi sands complacency syndrome, where you tend to view elephants after a while like you do impala, where you just drive into the middle of them and they don't even react to you when you're around. And it's always good to have a sighting like that, which just reminds you that that's an elephant and you don't want to be trifling with elephants. What a wonderful sighting. Woo! Let's go a little bit further forward. I think they're actually going to pop out on the road around the side. Curious one, a nice question, and it goes deeper than the question you've asked. Sorry, I mean, I'm really getting a little tongue-tied because that was just so wonderfully exciting. Um, curious one. You want to know why young elephants put their trunks in their mouths when they're excited? Or, oh, sorry, when they're not feeding. It's because they're excited. It's exactly the same as a child sucking its thumb. It gives them comfort and 
and they do it with each other as well. So elephants, if they're feeling nervous, will just reach their trunks into another elephant's mouth, and that's how they say hello and just sort of reassure each other that everything's okay. So that's what was going on there, curious one. And then the little ones, yeah, so they'll just kind of put their trunks in their mouths if they feel a little uncomfortable, just makes them, makes them feel a little bit more at home. Uh, and yeah, it was, it's a bit like fidgeting as well. That was, that was a really short, sharp, astonishing sighting. <laughs> what I'm going to do is go down around the corner here and we'll see if we can pick them up going across the next road, which is Philemon's cut line. I, I mean, the nearest water from here now would be Treehouse Dam. I'm not sure why they would be going there when there are so many other sources of cleaner water at the moment after the rain we've had. But maybe they were spooked by a lion somewhere in the bush here. Maybe that's why they were a bit protective of each other. I'm not sure. Look at the cloud coming in from the south here. Marvellous. So we won't be looking at the Nkahuma Pride today. They have been found outside of our area. Here are some dwarf mongoose. This is a little burrow of theirs. You can see them there watching us. Now, what's so interesting here is that this termite mound is still full of termites. You see that? Termites, look at them. Look at the little ones. The other morning, Scott and I went out and we tried to, we had a bit of a competition to see who could put his GoPro in front of the best termite mound for dwarf mongoose. I failed dismally. But I think Scott got one a bit like this, and I, where was this one? Sorry, everybody, I think I got a bit softer. Jerry, is that right? Okay, there we go. Microphone issues, everybody. The badger attached to my chest. These little chaps were just fantastic, and I don't know where they were the other morning when I was trying to find them. But as I say, the interesting thing to me here is that this termite mound is not unoccupied. It is full of termites, and I think that a few of them were probably eating termites. In fact, Dave, you pan a little bit to the left, there's the one, or just behind, there's one there actually eating termites out of the mound. See that? In that wet bit, up a bit. And to the, that's left of, left of your picture. He's eating little termites, little blighter, eating his hosts. This is a magnificent sighting. They are only about mm, three feet from us. So earlier, Monique, you're in London. You asked a question earlier about what would eat those flying ants that we saw. Monique, largely birds, you know. It would be things like swifts and swallows and bee eaters and drongos and those sorts of things which would eat those flying ants unless they of course landed on the ground in which case then something like a dwarf mongoose might eat them but remember that an ant has often got what we call formic acid in it i mean there's a whole family of ants that are called the formicid ants and they contain formic acid which although not particularly toxic uh, can burn the tongue a bit doesn't taste very nice and it's if you ever eat something that's been infested by ants and you pick it up late at night and it's, uh, it tastes sort of peppery and, and um, quite burny on the tongue. That is formic acid. And so I think you'll find that termites are a far preferable meal for something like a dwarf mongoose than will those ants be. I think you'll probably find that birds have a better or, or greater ability to digest them simply because they'd be eaten more often by birds. These chaps tend to go for things like scorpions 
and eggs and small reptiles and that sort of thing. This is magnificent. There are one, two, three, four, five, six. And that other, that little thing is, yeah, it's right next to the vehicle. Only about, what, Dave, about three feet now. Yeah, there's the vehicle. <laughs> I don't know where on earth this troop of mongoose was yesterday or a few days ago when I was trying to film them. Oh, I'm just going to try and shift myself so I can have a look. Um, curious one, nice one, curious cook, sorry, on YouTube. You want to know if the mongoose uh, will dust bath in order to clean themselves. If you watch them carefully, you'll find that they actually clean each other. So they don't do much in the way of dust bathing. Dave, look at these ones on the tree here. <laughs> this is just wonderful. special. So cool. <laughs> and those two were cleaning each other. Now they're playing, of course. And they do a lot of cleaning and playing with each other. And those are young ones. Now, of course, play behavior, we discuss it a lot and we see it a lot in all the mammal species. Incredibly important part of growing up if you're a mammal. And that's why it happens. It's not simply because it's a fun thing to do. There's a great reason that young mammals like to play and older ones don't like to play so much. Well, some do, but mostly you get a little bit tired eventually of playing. And that's because your neurosystem and your musculature has developed to the extent that you don't need to play anymore to make things work. I'm just going to try and make the picture slightly brighter. There we go. You can see a little, little pink nose. I'm amazed that the termites tolerate this. I don't suppose they have an enormous amount of choice, really. Um, and they probably just have sort of bored up the areas where the mongoose are. So those tunnels, like that one you can see there, that the mongoose will go down, I suspect is probably boarded up in the, on the inside so that the termites are not actually around where the mongoose are living. Of course, the termites do need to build the mound, or they build the mound by default. And so there will be openings, especially in hot weather, because those openings are very important air conditioners and very important at regulating the temperature in the mounds. And I guess then the tenants will eat the landlords. That little thing has now become, got too close for us to even film. Smiles for Rafe or Race. Uh, you want to know why are they not bothered by the biting termites? Well, Smiles for Race, most of the time the termites will not be able to bite. So the workers can't bite. They don't have the mouth parts for it. For the soldiers, I suspect you'll find that the mongoose are actually just very skilled at staying away from the bites. They'll bite them on the abdomen and get them from there, and then that's how, that's what they'll eat. You might find also, though, that there's a situation here where they don't eat the soldiers, and when the soldiers take over, often what happens is if you go to a mound like this and you go to a freshly, or a piece of the mound that is being freshly built, it will be covered by workers. And as soon as they perceive a threat, the workers disappear inside and they're replaced immediately by vicious soldiers. And maybe, you can see now none of them seem to be eating any termites. Maybe all the workers have been replaced by soldiers now, and so the mongoose are avoiding. 
Dave, these two are having a massive fight underneath the underneath this log. No, they've now gone too far behind. I'll keep watching. But there are two of them having a right royal ruckus there. There we go. Dave, if you look right under the log here. There. Just look in there. They're having a huge fight. One of them was, there we go. <laughs> And I think that's play, but it's definitely play behavior. There are three of them now in the middle of it. <laughs> and the whole troop now will not stray far from this mound. Day is pretty much over for these chaps. That is so cool. Four of them. They're all young. They're sort of teenager, I guess, teenager sized. smaller ones just join them, slightly smaller than the others, and wants to get in on the action, biting one of them's ears. <laughs> Every little pink mouths you can see when they start to bite each other bright pick inside to the mouth and sharp needle-like little teeth. That is classic, look at them. And I'm always amazed by how adept they are at being sort of semi-bipedal. A bit like a meerkat. A meerkat, of course, is able to sort of sit back on its haunches. And these, these can do the same thing. And when they're fighting like that, they kind of rear up and sit on their haunches. And that's how they fight with each other. Which, of course, most quadrupedal or four-footed animals struggle to do. In fact, just about anything other than a human being struggles to do that. This is just wonderful. Interesting one, James Richard, are any of the larger mongoose species a threat to the dwarf mongoose? Um, I would have thought a slender mongoose, probably not. That's the largest diurnal mongoose that we get here. They're about four times the size of a dwarf. They might be, but I think it's unlikely. I think a white-tailed mongoose might be a bit more of a threat, but they, of course, are nocturnal and would be much too big to get anywhere near the entrance burrows. Of these little termite, of these little mongoose. So I think maybe a white-tailed, but I don't. You know, they definitely eat other small mammals, so I don't see why they wouldn't eat one of these chaps. Except to say, look at that one eating the alates there, Dave. Just up a bit to the back and the right. Oh, sorry, left. Sorry, 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 left. One on the far left is eating termites. He's pulling out the youngsters, the royals that are coming out to fly. That's him there. You can just see the shiny wings, shiny gossamer wings of the poor alates who are not going to be able to even f make their nuptial flight. Delicious peanut tasting dinner for this mongoose. Of course, lots of other carnivores will eat them, but they do have a very powerful smelling anal gland. Um, all the mongoose have something similar, and so they can be pretty smelly, and I think that probably helps to defend them against predatory attack. But of course, we have seen them being eaten by leopards. I've seen plenty of leopards chase them, even if it's just for fun, especially young leopards. Speaking of which, everybody, you know that Karula's two cubs are absolutely fine. We know that, so please don't worry about them. We'll keep you updated as and when we get news. Oh, no, these termites are taking a hammering. <laughs> these dudes. Do you see them disappear like that? I'm wondering if there isn't a bird, or if maybe it was just the movement on the back of the vehicle here. 
Hmm. That must have been us. Cat in Tampa, just as you asked your question, you say you, you should know this. I don't see why you should know this at all, Cat. So many animals out here. You want to know if they have a sentry, like meerkats have a sentry. Um, yes, they do. They have a number of sentries. I'm not sure if they are as if their roles are as defined as they are within the meerkats, but certainly there will be adults that are around looking out all the time, just like that one's doing. And they made one alarm call, just one, and they all disappeared. Uh, it was amazing to see. I've never actually seen that. I'm completely calm, eating their termites, running around, playing, one alarm call, gone, all of them. <laughs> and you can maybe just hear them talking to each other. Citing this. Where were you all the other day? And they will go down into the mound well before dark so that they can be totally safe by the time the nocturnal animals move around. An owl would happily eat one of these chaps. So they'll stay away from any darkness. This is just the most amazing sighting. They have that group in the middle there are aloe grooming. You can see them cleaning each other. And we had a question there about whether they take dust baths or whether they, you know, how they clean themselves. They kind of do it for each other. Another really important part of many mammal societies is that kind of aloe grooming or the I scratch your back, you scratch mine kind of principle. And what it is, it's reaffirming social bonds. There is a very strict hierarchy amongst the males and the females in a troop of mongoose like this. So the males will have their own hierarchy, and so will the females. And it's very similar to a wild dog pack. And Deb in Ohio, you were asked, wondering about the hierarchy and the social structure. It's actually extremely similar to a wild dog pack where these chaps live in a society that is dominated by an alpha pair, a male and a female who are the only ones to breed. Sometimes a beta pair might breed, and just as with the dogs, those pups, as they're called with mongoose, may or may not be killed by the alpha pair. And then amongst the rest, amongst all the rest of the subordinate members of the troop, there is a definite hierarchy. Separate sex hierarchy, so the males and females will be in different hierarchies. And those social bonds and hierarchies are reaffirmed by what looks like innocuous play behavior and a bit of aloe grooming here and there. They will all have very deep uh, meaning to the stru social structure of this little troop. And that's one of the things we're hoping as the months go by here to try and document when we will probably do quite a lot more filming of them going forward. Brent Leo Smith come in. Brent is trying to hail me on the radio, I think. I'm currently with a troop of dwarf mongoose on Zoe's Road. A affirmative, thank you. So Brent's just trying to find out where I am so that we don't overlap. And he's going to head off towards the eastern parts of Bifelsok. We're on the west with the largest troop of dwarf mongoose I've seen for a long time and certainly the most confiding. Just brilliant. Hmm. Now, Katrina and Adrian, you're asking basically about the taxonomy of a mongoose. And Katrina, you want to know if they are basically weasels. And Adrian, you want to know if they are rats. They are neither. A rat, of course, is a rodent, which is an entirely different order. So the rodents would include rats, gerbils, squirrels, guinea pigs, 
the capybara, which is an enormous rodent of South America, and even the porcupine, believe it or not, it's the largest rodent that we get out here. Then, if you go up a level to the order, this order is the, called the order of the Herpestidae, which basically includes only the, um, well, it includes only the mongoose that we get here, and of course the surrogate or meerkat. Now, the weasels are in a family of their own as well, and their family is called the, hang on a second, I do know this, I'm actually looking at it now, it's the Mustelidae, that's right. So it's the same, it's the same, um, it's the same family as the badgers live, belong to. Now what's interesting, I'm not going to show you the book because there isn't actually a diagram of it, but there are, the family or the order carnivora is split into two suborders. One, the caniforma, or the dog-like carnivores, and two, the filiformia, or the cat-like carnivores. And the rodents are not in, e in either of those two areas. They're in a completely different order of their own. But the subfamily or the suborder that the mongoose belong to is the cat suborder, the filiformiae, and the weasels and the badgers, they belong to the caniformia or the dog suborder. So it's quite interesting that um, they're not vaguely related to weasels, and I can see why you'd think they would be related to weasels, and you can also see why they might be thought of to be related to rodents or rats, but they're completely different. I can actually draw that for you, so straight lines is probably quite easy for me to draw for you. All right, let's leave these chaps to themselves. We'll carry on down. I'm wondering if that magnificent herd of elephants won't be at Treehouse Waterhole, so let's go and have a look there. Marvelous, thank you chaps. I'm not even afraid of the engine noise anymore, which is fantastic. All righty, let's go across to Brent while we move and we'll give you an update from him. So, uh, unfortunate news. Uh, well, fortunate if you're in Kahuma. Uh, they were found with a buffalo kill, from what I could hear, uh, in Simbambili. So just after we left you when we were chatting to Sean, those, we found the tracks of them crossing and then about 10 minutes later, we heard over the radio that they had been located. So we've decided to come to the far east of Jumana and just have a quick squiz around, see what's out and about. So far, very little that has a heartbeat, but we will see what we can see. Oh, here we have a lovely little sickle bush. It's got some pretty little flowers. You can see a very pink one there, and then you see the very sort of slightly bedraggled just to its left. So, uh, oh, there we are, all that one down there. So you see where there's pink, and some of them are white. There's a pink, that one still hasn't opened properly. And if we go down from that one, left slightly, there we go, there's bedraggled white. So pink has not be yet been pollinated and white has. So there we go, a color signal from this tree's flowers to let the insects know which flower it should be focused on. A nice little co old common name for them was the Chinese lantern tree. There's very pretty flowers hanging down and look a little bit like a lantern. In guiding fraternities, quite often known as the flat tire tree, very, very dense wood, and those spines have been known to work their way through quite a few game drive tires over the years. So, hi, Deborah, the armchair traveller, is wondering about this grass growth around us. Oh, hello, Kudu. Zzz. 
There's a female there, and a little male to the right with another female as well. Well, there we go. While we look at these kudu, Deborah is wondering, is this grass at its peak? Uh, or do I think, is it going to grow a little bit more? Deborah, it all depends on the weather that comes after this. It will probably grow at a little bit more, a couple more centimetres. And then, if we don't get any more rain before the end of the month, I think then that's pretty much done. But it all depends. Uh, if we continue to have these nice, cool days with a bit more rain, it might grow a bit more. What you spotted, could you? Wouldn't be nice if these kudu spotted a leopard for us. Our ears facing directly forward. Very important for a kudu. It's hearing. They live often in very thick bush. You can actually see the bolus of food in her mouth. And she's adding to at the moment from that little zebra wood. And all the flies on her face. So after that rain and a, a little bit of a warm afternoon today, it would have caused an, an explosion of flies. But if we get a nice hot sunny day, there will be even more. Uh, that little bit of heat after the moisture will cause them to uh, cause them to hatch. So delicately picking those leaves there, using her lips and her tongue. As we watch this kudu browse in the bushes. Oh, she definitely keeps looking. I think it could be more kudu there than she keeps seeing. Judy is wondering why don't the trees just maintain a constant high tannin level to fend off the browsers? Well, Judy, it probably... Uh, there's an impala that ran out there. That's what that kudu was looking at. Um, so, it would probably take a lot more uh, sugars and nutrients to, con to constantly maintain that high tannin level. So, in terms of, it wouldn't be sort of viable to do it for extended periods. Very alert animals could do. Very pretty. You can see this adult female ears a little bit ripped. What happens when you get old? Most of those rips look actually like they're from biting flies. Hey, old lady. And in the distance, I don't know if you can hear that. And there's a, one of my favorite little birds, a Koki Franklin often described as a rusty bed spring sound. All right, well, kudus, enjoy your afternoon tea. Let's go see what else we can find. And it is amazing how quickly the bush changes this wonderful green all around us all of a sudden, after it was beginning to look a little bit desolate for a while. All the pans full. Hopefully we should start seeing some foam nest frogs and other creatures. We've been chatting a bit about the grass, the grazing, the drought. And James Dungeon on YouTube is wondering how long will grass stay dormant for? Well, James, it's not necessarily dormant. Uh, a lot of the grass, the growing points of grass are below the surface of the ground. That's why when you actually drive over grass, it doesn't actually do any damage to it. 
uh, as those growth points are below the ground. But it would take a serious couple of years, sort of five, six years, um, of no water whatsoever for the grass to die completely. And even then, some of the seeds would still lie in dormancy for possibly up to over 10 years uh, before erupting. I've been keeping my eye out for some wild flowers, one of my favorite things out in the bush. But unfortunately, I think we're gonna have to wait another day or two before we start seeing a real increase in wild flowers. If we have a look at the sky here, Chandra and I were actually chatting about it a little bit earlier. We will try to get up to a high point where you can see it. Curious ones wondering if that's smoke or rain in the distance. Uh, it's most definitely rain. There's a low-lying clouds. And hopefully they will overnight bring us some more wet weather. Speaking about all the wonderful water around, uh, James has got a patch, one of my favorite patches of water at Juma, to show you. Uh, there is a little terrapin swimming around in apparently Brent's favorite patch of water. Well, it might be his favorite patch of water. I certainly wouldn't try and drink any of it. It's got a lot of muck in it. Those are arrow marked babblers you can hear that are disturbing my speech. Shut up. There we go. So that is a serrated hinged terrapin. Now, we're supposed to get marsh terrapins here as well. They're supposed to be in temporary water sources. Uh, they're supposed to come out of the mud and live in the puddles. But I've yet to see one here, and the distinguishing feature, apparently, is two little tentacles coming out of the chin of the March terrapin. The serrated hinged terrapin doesn't have that little chin, chin tentacle. I'm glad I don't have tentacles coming out of my chin. Now, there are also some dwarf mongoose alarming to the, what is now the left-hand side of your s screen. You see, we're, we're opposite now. So what I'm going to do is reverse, and let's just drive down the road there and see if we can't see it. We did hear or see a bird fly off, a big bird. So maybe there's a raptor or something like that sitting in a tree there that might be quite interesting. Let's go and have a look there. Just down the road here, I did see a bird, like I say, fly up off the ground. I don't know what it was, but I'm sure that's what's making those mongoose upset. And their alarm call, of course, is what gives them their shangan neck. I think it's all. I think it's all. But just a lot higher up than that. Smaller voice box, you know. And I can still, they're still shouting. Let's just look in the trees around here for a raptor, large bird. Sorry, we went black screen there. The name it is Matsigizo. Matsigizo. There, you can hear them saying it. There, 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 there. It's a lesser spotted eagle. It's a lesser spotted eagle. I'm just going to try and roll forward. I don't want to start the car. Or is it? There, do you see it, Dave? It's in the tree ahead. And what that, oh, what it, what it's been doing is eating termites. They love termites, so that's what the birds were alarm calling at. A lesser spotted eagle, and it's easy to identify at that distance when it flies off because it's got that very white uh, sort of band on the top of its bottom. Cool. 
And I'll show you what, they, what it was eating. They're all flying out of this mound here, which when you, again, if you looked at this mound, you'd say it was probably inactive, but it isn't. I'll find you the entrance now. Let me just jump out the car. Can you see where I am, Dave? Yep. Here is where the bird has been feeding on tiny little worker termites, no bigger than sort of um, maybe three millimeters across. There are a whole lot of ants in here that are trying to kidnap the termites. I'm just trying to find where the alates are coming out of. It's just amazing. Oh. <laughs> This is really cool. Wait. Wait there, everyone. I just don't really want to touch what this is. <laughs> so many of you have asked us about dung beetles. And as soon as the rain comes, they pop out. And here they are eating some dwarf mongoose dung, which is not particularly delicious stuff. But there you can see, sorry, amazing kind of rainbow copper colored dung beetle. One of which is now trying to burrow into my fingers. And they're eating mongoose dung, which don't smell so fly. So I'm going to put it back. Yuck. I was trying to see where they're coming out. Here. The alates are coming out of the holes here, just where you can see them here. And every so often you'll see one fly away. Again, purely because of the rain. And what it allows them to do when they fly off, male and female will meet each other, they'll mate and then the male and female will dig down into the ground. And they can't do that unless there has been rain because the ground is too hard. Brilliant. That's wonderful. They're flying all around us. Right. On the and get into a more... Did you get the colour on those dung beetles? So it's got a bit chilly. I've popped my jersey on. And we're just heading out into this open spot. The, the clouds seem to be getting a little bit more heavy. Uh, Jandre is worried we're going to get very wet. I, myself, am... Still not convinced, but he, let's have a look at these clouds. It's a very dark and ominous sky. It does seem to be building, which is good. We're definitely not going to say no to more rain. There's another heavy set of rains forecast for the weekend. So, fingers crossed that they make an appearance. Decided to take one of the roads less, that we travel less often on Juma. See if anything pops out. For a while today, I thought the clouds might break, but they've slowly rolled back and settled in. So 
Uh, James Richards says it must have been a very unsuccessful year for the foam nest frogs. How many hatched and just dropped into empty pans? Well, I'm sure quite a few, James. I wouldn't know the exact number of foam nests in the Sabi sands, but I'm sure quite a few of them were unsuccessful. Even in very good wet years, you find that foam nest frogs will uh, sometimes put it over the most minuscule puddle. Uh, maybe it comes with a few years' experience refining the right pan. But then a lot of them, I think, would have held off. Um, and we might be seeing some foam nests in the next week or so. What I am hoping to hear tonight, especially with this cool overcast weather, is uh, the banded rubber frog, which is one of my favorites, uh, calls out here in the Sabi Sands. And it could sound something like this. And keep going for quite a long time, holding that tone. Very, very pretty. Now you can see here, the grass hasn't had that much time to start growing yet. Uh, but there is tiny specks of green coming out. There we go. Every there, just little bits of green popping out. Some grass, some flowers, but they don't, or some flowering plants, but they don't have any flowers yet. I uh, will definitely be keeping an eye on them. Beard and Je James, oh, we've got that spider web. There we go. Um, are wondering, are there any geothermal spots uh, in the Sabi Sands or in the Drakensberg? Uh, there are none, to my knowledge, in the Sabi Sands. And I'm trying to think of any. Jono, do you know of any? I know you've hiked quite a lot in the Drakensberg. I don't think so. The geothermal spots I can think of in South Africa, the first one that comes to mind is. Uh, very, very, very creatively named, a place called Warm Baths or Varambat. Uh, there is some geothermal activity there. I know there's a few in the, in, in the Karoo, um, and I'm just trying to think. Western Cape. Western Cape, yeah, but not in this area. I don't know of any in the low felt, actually, so unfortunately not. Otherwise, when winter came, I think you would find the whole Safari Live crew hiding in one of them. Oh! VM, VM is uh, sitting in final control and he's just popped through one of his spots called the Eiland. Um, I did not know that was geothermal. So that's about, as the crow flies, about 160 odd kilometers uh, northwest of us. Uh, I don't know much about it. Um, I've driven past it. I didn't uh, understand it was a, a hot spring. So there we go. Learn something new every day. But again, that's on a very different soil type and rock type to what we have here. And VM on some of his leaves likes to obviously soak up the geothermal vibes and go to DA land. in Ohio would like to know, is the Nile monitor related to the crocodile? We saw a Nile monitor at the beginning of the sunset safari. And it's about as closely related as an elephant is to a hippopotamus in the fact that they're both mammals. Uh, they are both reptiles. A monitor is a lizard, uh, not a crocodilian. And they have a very separate sort of branch of evolution that probably broke away 
if not hundreds of millions, yeah, probably, it's not hundreds, or if not fifties of millions, hundreds of millions years ago. So they're not very closely related to, at all. One of the more little known facts about the monitor, it is one of the largest predators of crocodiles. Even though they're much smaller, uh, they are expert nest raiders. And during crocodile breeding season, one of the reasons the female crocodiles stay so close to their nests is to try to protect from monitor lizards. Oh, what's that there, Jean? Where are my binoculars? Just, I think it's just a bush. Have a look. Oh, false alarm. Bush. Hi to Debbie in Vancouver, who's actually got a very interesting question, and I'm not 100% sure on the answer to that, Debbie. Uh, Debbie understands that reptiles have a Jacobson's organ. Do they use it the same way as mammals? Um, if anything, I'd probably say they probably utilize it more than mammals. Uh, they'll be far more reliant on it than mammals, and I'm definitely going to have to have a look. If any of you guys can find the information on that, uh, please send it through to me on questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Um, how does a cow use its j or, uh, oh, Jacobson's organ and do they use it similarly to, to mammals? I, I'd say, I'm, I'm guessing here, yeah, but I'd say they probably have quite similar functions in some ways. Uh, in other ways, I think the, the, the reptiles might be a little bit more developed uh, as they don't have any of vocalizations really to speak of, uh, to communicate with, and with their body language as well, I think it'd be quite difficult. They do transmit more information through the organ of Jacobson than uh, mammals. But we're gonna keep checking the Mawati while we do that. Let's jump back on with James and some striped donkeys. Now, I promise shortly, just behind those trees, of course, will appear the zebra that you can now see fairly well hidden. And what I would like you to notice is the dazzling effect that their stripes have on you. Isn't it dazzling? I've just been reading a book called Invisible. And the book talks about, unsurprisingly, invisibility and the various ways and means that people have tried to use to make themselves invisible over the course of the years. One of the things that's talked about is military camouflage. Now, for a long time, and, and oh, do you hear that? Oh, it's a little alarm call. A bit of play fighting going on. with my story now let's just watch them play there um, of course the best I think the best theory for why is <laughs> bizarre the best theory for why I think zebras have got stripes of course is that it, it breaks up their outline and it makes them difficult to see if you're hunting them in this kind of light and they're running through the bush it kind of breaks up the outline these guys are having a proper fight Let's get into position to see them. And what this book told me is that during the First World War, in fact, during, I think it was, no, it was the Second World War, they, they started to paint the ships zebra colors. And they've got incredible photograph of, sorry, let me go forward here. Incredible photograph of this frigate, this war boat painted like a zebra in the hopes that it would try and sort of uh, break the outline and make it invisible to U-boats. Uh, and they still actually don't know whether it worked or not. It certainly didn't make it any more obvious, but it's the most ridiculous picture in the world. 
uh, up, update. Apparently, it was the First World War that they tried this, not the Second World War. Thank you very much for that. Geraldine, who gave you that information? Ah, this is... <laughs> that update comes courtesy of v VM the Wildebeest, who's in the final control at the moment. Thank you, VM. Isn't that a lovely picture of them with the giraffe there? I, wonder if I didn't actually sort of sex any of these chaps, didn't find out if they were... I didn't find out whether they were all little stallions, and they might be a little bachelor group. And that's why they're all playing. They do actually look like they're all young stallions. That's exactly what's going on here. And I can tell at, that dist at this distance because of the skinny stripe underneath the tail. The females obviously have a much wider stripe. So that's not uncommon then for young, young chaps to have a bit of a fight, as you know, just as, is it, as it is with human beings. Elephants do the same. Giraffe do the same. Human beings do the same. Young men will wrestle with each other to... It's supposed to be in playfulness, but quite often it's to establish a kind of dominance hierarchy. They've chased off the giraffe. That is amazing. It's the great thundering of hooves I can hear. Anyway, oh, brilliant zebra sighting. All right, well, thank you, VM, for that. Uh, it was ships in the First World War painted like zebra. They did all sorts of other outlandish things. I painted them all sorts of different colours to try and make them invisible. I don't think it's any surprise that ships these days are painted grey. Right, our plan from here, everyone, is to go and just have a quick look at the hyena den. It's going to get dark quite quickly, uh, so we'll just have a quick look there and see what we can find. Otherwise, we will drive out with the spotlights on and see what the night has to offer us. I'm going to drive a little bit quicker, just so that we can get there with a bit of light lift. The one disadvantage, I suppose, to these clouds is that it does make things darker faster. I must say, VM does come up with the old, uh, the old real gem, and I would never have guessed that... <laughs> <laughs> He'd correct me on whether the zebra striped ship was in the First or Second World War. <laughs> Apparently, it's because he really likes ships a lot. Yeah, I shall, I shall have to uh, provide you with a model ship for your birthday. Of course, all men still like to receive children's models. I give my brother regularly, who is now almost 40, uh, balsa wood planes to build for himself. He seems to enjoy that. Much more than getting an adult gift. Like a box of handkerchiefs or something. Checking around the area of Weaver's Nest, and I just got a feeling that Tingana hasn't been seen in a while. And sometimes he does like to use these roads that run off our southern boundary as access points into the area. So. We're going to keep moving. And see what's out there to be found. AFM.
So Patricia on YouTube said she thought this, the soil here was quite sandy, so it wouldn't make mud when it rains. Well, Patricia, what we have here is quite a lot of duplex soils, which means sands on top of clay. And a lot of that is very shallow sand, about this much before you hit the clay. And of course, if it's completely saturated by water, uh, you can sink through that so as sand onto the, the clay. And also all the floodplains and, and, and low-lying areas around the little creeks and uh, drainage systems will all be predominantly clay as well, which will make very serious mud. None of your business on YouTube, it's none of your business. That's it, that's all I've got. No, I'm just joking. Uh, none of your business says, you've been hearing the rain singing frog uh, on the tumor cab. Uh, I'm not sure what the rain singing frog is and which one it is. Uh, I've probably heard seven or eight different species every night in that area. Uh, so what I will do is I'll slowly make my way towards the Juma Pan to see if I can discover what the rain singing frog is. So there's multiple species that we can can be heard at the moment. It's getting dark very early with these clouds. At a half light, it's almost too dark to use the spot, um, too light to use the spotlight, but too dark not to. And if you are ever in the bush driving yourself around, rather don't use the spotlight. Look for movement. Uh, quite often, when you use a spotlight in this low light, your eyes become so focused on that little ring of light that you don't actually look around properly, and you'll often miss things. Eagle. Just also feeding off termites, and as it took off, just heard all the, the sh white crown shrikes give. Oh, there it goes. So, after not seeing very many of them at all, uh, I, this is the third one I've seen today. And I believe you also saw one with James. So that's four different sightings of a bird. We didn't see much before the rain. So a lot of those migratory species will have been moving around looking for spots that have had rain. Good evening, a proto-prod on YouTube. Proto-prod would like to know how often we get Canada geese in South Africa. Well, I can comfortably say, without the aid of a human, human being, never. Uh, they don't migrate this far. Uh, Canada geese, as far as I know, only migrate in, in the Americas, uh, also in the Northern Hemisphere. I'm not sure if they go down as far south as Mexico, but I know they definitely don't come across to the African continent.
So hello to Penny Alleg in Durban, KwaZulu Natal in South Africa. Penny said with the drought, they've been having some incredible bird sightings. And they had a booted eagle being mobbed by yellow-billed kites, which is a really amazing thing to see. And Penny's wondering, with the rain now coming, does it mean some of the migrant raptors are going to stay longer? It's very difficult to say. Um, Penny, they might. They might need to build up some more reserves before they head back north. Um, or they might head north earlier. Uh, to places like Zambia and Tanzania that have had normal rain so far this year. So it'll be very, very interesting to see whether they hang around a bit longer or they depart even a little bit earlier. So while we make our way towards the Juma Pan to try to find out what the singing rain frog is. Uh, let's go see what Commander Bond is up to. Well, the hyena den is a very peaceful place this afternoon. That is pretty there, and she is feeding November. They are very comfortable. And then the two Ds are out. Little D2 walking back towards them now from basically under the vehicle. There she is. He is, sorry. And there's little D1. So the two D ones, in case you're a new viewer, we've named them after the month in which they were born. This will probably become confusing during the course of this year when more cubs are born to this clan. But we've got November, who is suckling, and then the two Ds, December 1 and December 2, easily noticed for, or differentiated from each other because D1 has got a little white cap to the edge of her left back foot. And she's a female, we think, and I think D2 is a male. Very difficult to tell where. It's getting dark now. You can see, oh, there's another hyena there. There's an adult. Oh, that's probably Corky, which is their mother. Yes, looks like her. That kind of um, strange contrasty picture that you've got there is because we've had to pump something called gain on the camera. So although the color doesn't look very natural, it's basically sucking as much as light out of the scene as possible. It's much lighter on your screen than it actually is in real life. And let's just have a little listen to all the bird song around us. Ashley, you say that you miss South Africa. You're in England at the moment and you miss Africa. I know lots of people who live in England who are either South Africans or who are English and have lived here before and visited here and they feel exactly the same way. And you want me to try and describe the smells and sounds and a bit of the feeling that you're perhaps not getting watching it virtually through your screen. Right, well, here we go. What we did have was some white browed scrub robins calling in the background. It's, there's a breeze blowing. It's kind of swirling from all over because there's a front coming through. There's a very... There, you can feel it now. There's a very fresh smell of moist earth. That petrichor smell is very subtle at the moment because we haven't had the sun beating down on the wet earth yet. You can hear the odd cricket that's come out as a result of the rain. You hear that? GG. And every so often in the background you can hear a grass frog. But 
very fresh, clean smell in the air, Ashley, not that kind of dusty smell that we've had for most of the summertime. So very really clean. We're not going to stay here, I'm afraid. Um, the hyenas are, of course, going to think about moving off. The adults and the youngsters will go inside, and we're not going to shine a light here. And it's got so dark, I'm afraid, that I think we're going to have to leave. D1 just vomited. That was lovely to see. Marvellous. OK, well, that's a nice way to leave. <laughs> Looks like a piece of bone or something that wasn't quite ready to digest. All right, chaps, we'll try and come back in the morning and say hello properly. Now, the first time I came to this den and the hyenas were here, they all came running towards us like a great pack of dogs that might come running down the driveway to greet their favorite owner. And it made me so pleased and I felt so honored until they did precisely the same thing for Jamie the next day. So it wasn't, it wasn't me at all, I'm afraid. It was just the, the company of the vehicles and a break in the monotony of living in a termite mound. Ashley, the other thing that, of course, is, is, is wonderful about this kind of uh, atmosphere that we have here is the atmosphere of expectation that surrounds the insect life. And we've had lots and lots of woo. Lots and lots of termites, lots and lots of um, flying ants, as you know. The dung beetles have come out, and it's just wonderful to see them all flitting about the place. The air is filled with them at the moment, and it hasn't been throughout the summer because we just haven't had any water. This is not good news. It would seem that the headlamps on this vehicle are not working. hasn't just come back from the hospital. Oh, no, wait, she has. Aim everywhere in the world that a mechanic will say that he'll do something and then seemingly detach something else when he sends your car back. Impala. I think it's, yeah, it's Impala. We both saw something going on to the road behind us. It was some impala. Right, so let me retrieve the spotlight. This is quite a nice spotlight because it is light. interesting question about why it seems that hyenas, please excuse me while we're driving around at night not looking you in the eye the whole time, but you know, I don't want to crash into something. Judy, you want to know why it seems to you that the hyenas suckle on their sides and not so much sort of perpendicular? And the reason, Judy, is that they've got too big. They can't do it perpendicular anymore because they've got too tall, and so they lie on their sides, and so th they can reach the, the teats more easily. And uh, when they're very little, they absolutely do lie straight forward, and they suckle. They'll do it at all angles. But now, like November, she's much too big to try and reach the nipple if she's standing up or even lying down front on. Remember that there's shoulders or the muscles that start to get very big very quickly, and so it, they become, I mean, they, you watch an adult hyena lying on, off the, the ground, there really is there's a strong slope from the shoulders any of the other carnivores out here. And so they have to find a way of doing it that is convenient. Lying on Interesting observation. All right, let's go back across to Brent. Our signal is breaking up. Oh. There we go. There's a terrapin enjoying the very full Juma pan. And none of your business was asking about the singing frog. Now, we can hear a frog behind us, so none of your business. Can you let me know if that's the frog? That bling, really like almost a, a chortle. 
for lack of a better word, but that's called a bubbling casina. And that's the only frog I'm hearing at the moment, but we'll listen carefully. So we're just going to keep quiet for um, a few seconds and see if we can hear anything else. still only the bubbling casinas that we can hear, but we will come back when it's a little bit later, see if we can hear any others. So none of your business. Let me know if that's the singing rain frog you're talking about. Oh, he's, uh, Jean, I just saw jean Ray move the camera quickly. I was excited to what he had found, but it was a fleeting glimpse of a night jar. Spotlight out. There we go. So, Mike on YouTube is wondering on these cloudy nights, will nocturnal animals come out early? Uh, the wind is suddenly just picked up, Mike. So that changes the the answer slightly. Windy, dark, cloudy. No, they actually come out generally later. And the reason for this is with this wind and with this dark, it makes it much easier for predators to catch things. Sometimes a civet might get moving a little bit earlier or white-tailed mongoose, but generally when it's windy like that, uh, they can't trust their ears and their smell so much, so they tend to come out a little bit later uh, to miss the peak times of the, predator, the, big, the bigger predators like lion and leopard. But as we say that, anything's possible and anything might happen uh, around the next corner. Hello, Palas. So, for those of you who might be new to the safari drives, we don't shine lights on the diurnal animals at night. Diurnal is the, the ones that are predominantly active during the day, as uh, it tends to blind them for a little bit, and we're not here to affect and make it easier for the predators to catch or kill, uh, or easier for the non-predators to escape. Bethany on YouTube says there's a frog that sounds like it says, rain, rain, rain. I'm still at a loss to what frog that could possibly be, Bethany. Um, I will go back when it gets a bit darker and see if any other frogs start calling. So it wasn't that bloop, bloop. So it wasn't the bubbling casino. So why don't you guys send in your impersonations, take a little video, send in your impersonations of the singing, mystery singing rain frog, and you can pop them through on email to questions at wildearth.tv or pop them on Twitter with the hashtag Safari Live. So Patricia on YouTube says, no, it sounds like ribbit, ribbit. 
uh, only joking. And do any of the frogs out here sound like bullfrogs? Well, Patricia, the, I'm not sure what North American bullfrogs sound like, but we have bullfrogs that sound like African bullfrogs and a very sort of deep very but deeper than that even. Might get lucky, maybe a bush baby, but even with this dark, windy weather, I think they might stay in bed a little bit longer as well. Do you see that evil creature there? It's shining its red eye at us. Do you know what it is, Jandre? Yes, I think it's Brian's, Brian's GoPro doing a time-lapse uh, of the sky. Ah, apparently James also spotted uh, the elusive GoPro time-lapse earlier. So, Andrew, Andrew. Speaking of elusive things and a dark night, I think Jandre and I, we have a a task to perform still this evening. Are we going to keep that as a, a little secret for just now? Give one standing by. Hi, Zoe at dawn. Uh, Zoe is asking, did Jamie and I have any wild dog sightings while we were on vacation? We actually did. Um, we saw the open pack of wild dogs, which are about 30 strong, but it was during the heat of the day and they were sleeping in a riverbed. Uh, we also had a really great cheetah sighting um, of a cheetah hunting impala in the middle of the day in Kruger. So that was quite nice uh, to be able to see that. Matthew, who's nine years old, is wondering, does anyone have a light like Scott's? So we can see the scorpions. Yes, we do. And I am on the lookout for scorpions as we speak, Matthew. in a good spot. So this is the area where we've seen serval a few times. And I've seen their tracks and dung as well. So I'm just trying to find a good spot to do this. Now, unfortunately, the trick is until I have a special adaptation made. I've got to be very careful about hyenas. And that's why I've been a little bit reluctant sometimes to put up my camera trap, because I don't want it to get chewed. But I think and I, there's a good spot around here where we can put it up where Howard the hyena might not be able to get to it and still catch the ongoings that happen during the night. Hyenas can jump quite high, so it's got to be quite high, but we get the angle right, so it looks down onto the road. Unfortunately, though, sometimes elephants also like to play with them. There we go. That's the spot. I'm just going to put that up like that. I'm do this with the light. There we go. And hopefully, we'll catch something interesting overnight. So 
there we go. So hopefully we're going to find something interesting, maybe a honey badger, maybe a, a serval, or even more rare in this part of the world, a caracal. So I think if we face it down like that, it should catch the road. And I think all my settings are correct, Yibble. So let's just get it into the spot. So I will, if we do find anything really interesting on here, I will post it so you guys will be able to have a look at it. But I've had such fun with camera traps all over Africa. Uh, believe it or not, when I was in Gabon, the biggest problem we faced with our camera traps, because there were no hyenas there, was elephants just being curious and playing with them and pulling them off the tree. So I'm going to take the risk. I don't think the Ellie's in this area are quite as curious as those forest ones. And uh, let's get it up. And hopefully we will catch something fascinating. There we go. Yeah, Andrew, um, what's your position at the moment? There we go. So that's, that should hold there. And just tie it up nicely. You don't want to leave any flapping things about, because that might attract the elephant's attention just out of curiosity. How do you think that angle was? Chandra? Should we look onto the road? Tilt it down a bit. There you go. Okay. All right, there we go. That's better there. Let's give the lens a little dust there. Jean-Andre, as a the cameraman is looking at me in shock and horror, using my finger on the lens. Let me use my jersey. There we go. Yeah, Andrew, we did get to see you, okay. but come into Torchwood. Uh, we're just on the boundary. Let's go. Put it on. Jean-Dre, smile. The first picture is okay. definitely going to be of us because I'm blinded by the light while I try to get back. <coughs> so it's got a motion sensor. It'll pick up anything that moves down the road during the night. So it will be the first thing it catches. And uh, we've been chatting quite a bit about frogs, and it seems like James has managed to find one. In front of his face. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm just trying to ascertain if this magnificent African bullfrog is going to eat a termite or not. He's sitting right at the entrance to a termite mound where the alates are coming out. And I think he's a little bit stunned by the light. And so Brenty has done you the, an impression of the call, and there is the actual creature himself. Now, what I'm going to do is go and stand behind him, and you'll get an impression of his size. He's not very big. Oh, there he goes. He's, I, I'm actually quite interested in his size. He's probably about, he might be about, three inches, no, more than that. Let me just work it out quickly. It's probably about five inches long. No, I won't get out, because I think he'll be disturbed. What I would really like for you to see, though, is him try and eat a termite. It's hilarious to watch. They do this kind of sideways twist when they get them into their mouths. Here comes something past his mouth now. They're not interested. I think he's dazzled by the light. Now, the way you identify these chaps is from the eye. You can see the eye, and then you can see a little crescent-shaped white bit. I don't know, can you see that, Dave? Is that full zoom? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can see a little sort of crescent-shaped white bit just behind the eye, and that's his ear. And that crescent-shaped white bit is a very distinctive marker. 
Dave and I are now being absolutely savaged by termites because we are the source of the light. And there's our magnificent bullfrog. Oh, he's wonderful, isn't he? Brilliant. He'll be loving these termites. And I don't know if you can hear some beautiful frog calls, which I've so missed. There, look, 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 look. <laughs> there we go. I'll do it again. Um, uh, you can, there, look, here we go. Do it again. You have no idea of the feeling of these termites climbing down our shirts, frog. It's all for you. Anyway, in the background, there's another wonderful frog, and as I say, we've missed the calls. There he goes. He's got another one. We've missed the calls of the frogs. That one is toast. No, it's flown away. Oh, toast. Got it. So he's obviously attracted by the, um, by the wing fluttering. Now, bullfrog, in the background, as I was saying, is the call of a bubbling casina. It's like little droplets of water being dropped. Bloop, 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 bloop. I don't know if you can hear it. But it's just the most wonderful sound of the summer. And all around, I'm sure you can also hear, is the fluttering of the termites' wings. You can hear them fluttering around. There he goes. Isn't he cool? The... <laughs> He's in full action now. Here he goes. Oh, he's quite close to us now. All right, Scott, at least Brent's also got a couple of these uh, bullfrogs. Let's go across to him. Thinking. Three. OK. So we've also got a bullfrog, and I just caught a glimpse of one of my favorite frog species, and I'm just trying to find him for you. But he's tiny in comparison. I think we're going to have to. He was just here. He's also feasting on the termites. Um, he looks like a grumpy old man. Let me just see. Here you go, Jean-André. Just, if you can, just shine it around there. You should pick him up, maybe, with a bit of the yellow light. Uh, but he can't hop. He sort of scuttles along the ground. I mean, very careful. I don't stand on him. Uh, just watch your mic, turn this way. He's right here somewhere. And I just said to jean I really hope we found a bushfrog rain frog. And now he's done a disappearing act. They move. They can't hop with anything, so they sort of like hobble around. They're really fat little guys. Oh, dear. It looks like he's escaped, and I don't want to stand on him. Oh, as you can see, the, the bullfrog is having a feast. Look at him go. And of course, all these termites are even more attracted to this area because of the lights of the vehicles. So we're giving him a proper feast. And he's going to be gluttoned by the time we leave. Oh, I'm so sad that little rain frog disappeared. There's a good chance we might find another one with the, ter with the LHs out. Just one last, last look. Awesome stuff. Look how pink his tongue is. And one quite last quick look for that little rain frog. Now he's tiny in comparison to this bullfrog that you're watching at the moment. But nevertheless, he won't have to eat as many termites to become full. OK, well, let's move on. Let's see if we can try to find another rain frog. 
So while we do that, the night time has brought out all sorts of small, wonderful creatures. Let's go see what James has got. Now, we haven't moved an inch, everyone. And what you see there might initially look like one beetle, but it is, in fact, two beetles. And they are either in the throes of passion. Look, 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 it's hunting. It's chasing down that termite. He's caught it. He's caught it. Look. Vicious, vicious, biting mouth parts. That's a ground beetle. Either carrying her lover or he carrying her. His lover, it's difficult to tell, but that termite is now toast. Look at that. That is just astonishing. <laughs> and you can see the one on its back there as well, yes. As Jerry says, fighting for its life. This is just amazing. So I don't know what else they could, that could, they could be. I mean, those are ground beetles, definitely. Ground beetles, as you can see now, voracious predators will be sucking out the insides of that termite as fast as possible. But whether they're mating or that's... I mean, they wouldn't be a youngster. They're not known for their amazing parental care. No, definitely wouldn't be a youngster because they're beetles. They have larvae as youngsters. So I think they must be mating. It's not a very vigorous process, as you can see. Yeah. I got to tell you, the mouth parts on a ground beetle are not attractive. They'll give you a nasty bite. So that termite didn't stand a hope. Probably about an inch long. It's wonderful having a night like this where we've got some insects around and some really entertaining stuff to look at. Quite often the nights here can be a little bit dull during the drought. Now, the one on the ground there in front there will eventually shed its wings. I wonder if it's a male or a female. There are lots of little predators around there. That little thing in the middle, that black thing running around just to the right-hand side, is, a, is an ant. And that will also be looking for something to eat. And then there's another approaching animal. What is that? There. That small black thing. Those look like cockroaches. See that? In fact, that's what the ground beetle caught. You know that it didn't catch a termite. They are, they're little cockroaches. There are lots of them wandering around here. It's exactly what they are. And that's not, yeah, I thought that thing looked a bit big to be a termite, the one that the ground beetle, the, that we've caught in flagrante delictum, as it were. They've caught a cockroach. Sorry, I've been waiting to throw in that uh, term in flagrante delictum since I began this job. It's my favorite. I just think it sounds so wonderful. In flagrante delictum. Yeah, they're eating one of those cockroaches. So we've got cockroaches, termites. Bullfrog has, oh, he's still there. No, I can still see him. And ground beetles. There's the bullfrog, Dave. He's coming into the kind of edge of our of our spotlight there, if you want him again. But before we do that, let's see if the cockroach rescues his mate. Oh, watch out, fellow. You see that? No, that's not a cockroach. That's a termite. And the ground beetle was not interested. Hmm. Right, I don't think that this beetle sighting is going to get particularly uh, more exciting than it is, but the brilliance of the final control has got a special treat for you. Slow-mo of the live kill we had just now. Here we go. trying to find there there's our frog and he's still hopping around same dude 
and he's going to be enormously fat at the end of this evening, especially as we're helping him out by putting a light here so that he can see what he's going to catch. Isn't that amazing to see how they catch the termites? And how pink the mouth is. And I just love the way when he bites, he kind of twists his throat sideways as he swallows them. And so fast. I found one this morning. Um, let me just turn the light a bit. I found one of them this morning, and it was cold. It was cold, quite chilly, and it could barely move, you know. Of course, they are ectothermic, which means they really do depend quite heavily on the outside or ambient temperature to be able to move. <laughs> so cool. He's catching many, many termites. Yeah, I haven't seen him take out one of the cockroaches yet. Oh. See that little jerk he gives as he swallows it. So cool. <laughs> oh, wow. This is what we've been missing out on the whole summer, everybody. Not just the bullfrog, but the myriad frog species that we get here. And the sounds, the wonderful sounds they make. And this is one of the disadvantages, of course, of a drought. really special. Hello, Heidi. You're in Switzerland, which, as I've said to you before, an appropriate name for where you live. Heidi, you want to know the frog can see in the dark? Yes, you know, I think they can, probably. Um, I don't know how well, but presumably quite well, because this is when you find them out. And they're normally out at night. Um, often eating these termite alates. So I think you'll find they actually see really well at night. I've no doubt that this floodlight is helping his activities immensely, but I think they can see. Otherwise, I don't know how else he'd be finding these things. I mean, the termite doesn't have a hope against a tongue that fast, does it? He's really got into his gears now. Whitney, hello. You want to know if we've got cane toads here? No, Whitney, we don't have cane toads in this particular area. I'm just trying to think. We were talking about cane toads the other day. Oh, they're those edible things, those enormous edible frogs. They're like the size of a chicken almost. Um, we don't have them here. I saw a picture of somebody who caught one and was taking it home to, to eat it. It's sort of a, a toad about that big. We don't have those here. Right, marvellous sighting that was. Absolutely brilliant. Come on, Wendy, let's press on. Oh, there we go, we've got some light. It's all going our way. Tampa Bay rabbit, who you living in Florida, and you say you, you used to live in Puerto Rico, and there they had a little frog that came out of the forest called a cokey, I think a cokey frog, and apparently they used to call the rain. Well, I don't know how they managed that, and I wish ours would do the same thing, but certainly I can probably tell you where that legend comes from. There's a little frog there. Oh, don't go back inside. There, 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 there. Just in the middle of the light there, Dave, there was a little thing. You see him? Um, Tampa Bay rabbit. Frogs here will often call just before they think it's going to rain. Let me just move this light. Uh, uh, I don't think he's going to come out again. That was a proper little frog. I don't know what it was. 
the smallest frog we get is a toad called a pygmy toad. And it's tiny, it's only about half an inch across. All right, everybody, that's it from this little sighting. I think we're gonna miss that frog. That's where he went in. So often we'll hear frogs starting to call just before it's going to rain. And a few times in September or October I heard that. And then of course they stopped calling because it didn't rain. going towards where Brent is, which is quite fun, but I'm just, it's so wonderful to be close to the water, so we'll be, we're going to go around towards the Juma Dam, but before we get there, I'm going to bid you adieu, because I think we're going to lose signal as we go through this little dip here. So thank you, David, for your efforts today, wonderful time. Thank you, Geraldine, the Cheesecake Kent, on directing, uh, being helped ably, of course, by Louise and Kirsten. And thank you to Brent. Wonderful to be driving with him again. And he's being filmed, of course, by Jean Dray. We will see you tomorrow morning at 05.30 before I go through the dip. Stay safe and happy wherever you are. Bye-bye. So now that it's dark, Jean Dray and I have made our way back towards the Juma Pan and Dam and listening to what other frogs are the singing rain frog might be in. So far, all I can hear is the bubbling casinas. And a dwarf puddle frog. Now, a dwarf puddle frog is about the size of my fingernail. So, it's about this big. So it's tiny, really, really difficult to ever see and they sound exactly like an insect. So you hear that, that But the difference between an insect and a puddle frog is at the end of the puddle frog's call, it goes tick, tick. There's oh, that, that's quick. It's quite difficult to discern because there are also a lot of insects making noise after this, this rain, but I can hear dwarf puddle frogs. Oh, I thought I heard another species coming into there the fray there. It sounded like a red-legged casino at the start of the call. But I don't think he says rain, rain, rain either. But it is so wonderful to have had this rain and this explosion of life that's coming from the rain with the frogs and the insects and the eagles and the termites. It's just, it's just incredible. Really hoping for a few more frog noises. Oh, there we go. Burr. Burr. A grey tree not a tree frog or a foam nest frog. There he is. Do you hear that, Jondre? them starting. So as it gets darker, a few more frog species coming in. There we go. I can actually see the frog. I've spotted the firm nest frog from his core. There he is, sitting on that dead branch. We go. You can just hear him, the grey treed frog or foam nest frog. Burp. So, guys, it's been great having you all with us, and from myself and the foam nest frog, we'll see you all in the morning. <laughs>